After over two years, Elon Musk has provided another Starship update down in Boca Chica, Texas. If you've been following the Starship program closely, this video is for you. I took the liberty of cutting down the hour and 15 minute long presentation into a really tight 10 minutes that is filled with new information and context for the decisions that Elon and SpaceX has been making for the Starship program. So let's get right into the cut down. I completely agree that the vast majority of resources should be dedicated to solving problems on Earth. Absolutely. I'd say like more than 99% of our resources should be uh, oriented towards solving problems on Earth. But it's, so, so it's important to note that like NASA's uh, annual budget is, is only 0.36% of the federal budget. And in fact, of, of the national GDP, it's less than a tenth of a percentage point. We, you know, we're only spending 0.1% <laughs> of our resources on space. I think. I think we that's okay. You know, like we we'll be fine. You know, you know, just make sure people don't think like, well, we is he suggesting that we just spend everything on space? No, I'm suggesting like maybe half a percent or something like that. Uh, we, we'll probably be okay. But the sales pitch for 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 going to Mars is that um, it's going to be a cramped, dangerous, difficult, very hard work. You might die, and that's the sales pitch. I hope you like it. Over time, I think we can probably get the, the, the payload to an orbit for orbital refilling to about 200 tons, uh, which is going to be very important for uh, getting to Mars. Payload capacity is like around 3,400 tons. Uh, it, it will increase over time, probably get to 36, maybe 3,800 tons. Thrust is around 7,600 tons. That'll probably increase too over time. Just to put this into perspective, though, the Saturn V was uh, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and Starship is 17. So it's more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V. The next booster, uh, we actually increased the engine count to 33. We finally settled on, on th 33 engines, which, which is about actually the most number of engines you can actually fit under that booster without like expanding the diameter. The stage zero, I'd say as complex and difficult as either the booster or the ship. I, I really want to emphasize that this is and it's a very difficult thing that requires a lot of hardcore engineering. The tower and the launch system, which I call stage zero, is just as important as stage one and stage two. Yes, there's, there's six Raptors on Starship, currently three uh, with the vacuum nozzle, three sea level. We'll probably end up adding another three vacuum engines to kind of you know, fill in the gaps and stretch the ship, uh, I think is gonna make a lot of sense. We, we, are, we are building a, uh, a launch site, a Starship launch tower at uh, 39A at uh, Cape Kennedy. We are also building a Starship production facility at, at the Cape, so we'll have production facility and launch site here and a production facility and launch site at the Cape as well. I mean, depending on, on how good things get with, with Starship, there are some scenarios where it, it might actually be the lowest cost means of transporting cargo long distances. So the interesting thing is that the capital efficiency of a rocket is, is, is much better than the capital efficiency of a plane for long distance flights. Now this would really be more for if you're going like quarter or third or halfway around the world. If you went from, I don't know, say here to Singapore or something, like that's a long flight. I mean, I don't know how long that is. I'm not sure you can even go there nonstop, but it's probably like 20 hours plus. In a rocket, it would be uh, less than an hour. So like 45 minutes or thereabouts. That means you, you, you'd be able to use the rocket 20 times more often than, than an aircraft. So it's 20 times the capital efficiency. So provided the propellant cost is competitive with aircraft, and bear in mind, like I was saying, like there's three and a half tons of, of liquid oxygen for every one ton of fuel, uh, and, and liquid oxygen is basically just the cost of electricity. I, there, there is a scenario where it's economically compelling to do long distance cargo and, and people transport with Starship uh, for a development cost that is, uh, I don't know, between five and 10% of Saturn V. Because we need to make it work, so it's not work yet, but it's, uh, it will work. Might be a few bumps along the road, but it'll work. I feel highly confident that we'll get to orbit this year. We're close to achieving one ra a rafter to uh, every day production rate, which is, is tough for a complex engine. By the end of this year, we'll be able to produce a ship and a booster per month. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am optimistic that we will get approval. Objectively, I think this is not uh, something that will be um, harmful to the environment. We've obviously flown the ship several times and done you know, multiple landings and you know, takeoffs and landings. We've, we've fired the engines a lot. So the, the, the reality is that, the, that it would not have a significant impact. Now, we do have the alternative of the Cape. We, we actually applied for environmental approval for launch from the Cape 
uh, a few years ago and received it. We actually are approved from an environmental standpoint to launch from 39A. I guess our worst case scenario is that we would be delayed for six, six or six to eight months to build up the, the Cape launch tower and launch from there. You know, with Falcon 9, I think it took us 14 or 15 attempts to successfully land the first booster. I don't think it'll take us that many with Starship because we have that experience, but it's certainly not a sure thing that it'll work the first time. Orbital refilling, and I, I want to emphasize it is refilling, not refueling, because it's uh, three and a half times as much oxygen than fuel. So we mostly are carrying oxygen up there. Optimistically, towards the end of next year, I'd be surprised if it's longer than two years. And there, there are a lot of additional customers that will want to use Starship. I don't want to steal their thunder. That's they're they're going to make their announcements. Once we make this work, it's it's a, an utterly profound breakthrough in access to orbit. And when you have an utterly profound breakthrough, the use cases will be hard to imagine. The future of Starbase, I think, it's well suited to be kind of like our um, advanced R and D location. So it's like where we would try out new designs and uh, new versions of the rocket. And, and then I think probably Cape Kennedy would be our sort of main operational launch site. I don't know, over time, I think there's going to be floating spaceports like ocean spaceports. We got these two converted oil rigs that are, that are going to be turned into orbital uh, launch sites and they, they can be moved around the world. Uh, because the rocket is quite loud, you want to be 20 miles away from a major city or 30 miles away from a major city so you don't, you know, disturbing people too much. Probably most of the launch sites long term will be kind of ocean or sea spaceports, maybe maybe located like 20 miles, 30 miles offshore. This would allow Starship to connect any cities that are on the ocean or on, on the sea and, and have a high flight rate, but w without disturbing people too much. Raptor 2 is an almost complete redesign relative to Raptor 1. So basically everything from the turbo machinery to the the, the chamber nozzle, the electronics, basically everything's been been redesigned. You know, a, a, a lot of the changes were deleting things. We deleted a lot. Rotating machinery, especially the inducers of the turbo pumps, are a lot more robust. We converted a bunch of flanges to welds, uh, and we, we're actually over time will convert even more flanges to welds. I hate flanges. And so, you know, we've got parts of that engine that are seven, eight hundred bar, you know, sort of 11, 12,000 PSI, which is nutty. The uh, pre-burner controllers have been consolidated into a, sort of a unified box as opposed to being kind of like all over the engine. I think uh, Raptor will not need shrouds. So shrouds are a huge pain in the ass, like basically putting a sh whole shield around the engine, especially for the gim gimbling engines. With, with a bit more deletion and integration, I think we the, the engine will be f sort of flame proof, uh, more or less, and, and then we can get rid of the shrouds, which would be a big mass savings. Oh, I think over time we can operate it at 330 bar sustained in the main chamber with, without having the, uh, the, the pre-runner pressures be too high. Uh, Starship will not have an independent abort system, but I think something that would make sense is to have the thrust to weight of the ship be enough that it could take off from the booster even if the booster has a failure at the pad level. Then even if there is something goes wrong with the booster, the ship can essentially fly away from the booster. And that would be like the nine engine version. And then even if you lost one engine, I think you should still be able to do an abort. So I think for crewed missions, we would essentially maybe detank the ship to some degree so that you'd have kind of a launch abort capability with the ship, even if you lost an engine. That, that'd be my recommendation. From a life support standpoint, we, we, we could scale up uh, the life support system in Dragon. That would certainly be an option. And, and that would work for uh, missions that are, say, um, a week or, or two weeks, that, that that would be fine. For missions to, to Mars, uh, you, you'd want uh, a life support system that uh, is renewable, essentially recycling recycling everything in a, in, in a closed loop system with close to zero uh, lost mass. So that, that's a harder problem, but it's not, it's not an immediate problem. We can certainly uh, scale up Dragon for any kind of missions that are you know, a few weeks long. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're close to having the hardware ready to go. I think we're, we're tracking to have the regulatory approval and hardware readiness around the same time. Yeah, so Phobos and Deimos thus far have been um, a relatively low priority. Um, we needed to make the launch site here uh, work. Um, this has been you know, quite a difficult endeavor. J just last month, we, we, we started to, we we're going to take uh, one of them and, and, and build at least a catch tower on it. I mean, ultimately, meaning like, I don't know, later this year, uh, build a, a, a full launch capability on one of the platforms. Hopefully by the end of this year, we, we will have a launch capability at Cape Kennedy at 39A. 
and on one of the, the, the ocean platforms as well. I mean, right now, of, of any technical problem, I'm spending the most time personally on, on uh, Raptor 2. The only remaining issue that we're aware of is melting the chamber. If that thing really wants to melt, you know? You know, we're flowing an, an immense amount of cryogenic fuel to cool the, the, the chamber in the channels. We have uh, head-end film cooling, we've got uh, throat film cooling, and we're just trying to get the exact sort of balance between head-end film cooling and uh, throat film cooling to not melt the chamber. We have uh, a couple engines in the stand that have seven or 800 seconds of operation and several start cycles. Looking positive, that's the remaining uh, issue is uh, melting the chamber. We're going to be making a lot of ships, a lot of boosters. You know, adding legs to land on the moon, that can be done pretty quickly. Yeah, I don't really see any conflict between the achieving rapid reusability and, and getting to the moon. The missions would, would happen pretty fast for refilling the, the vehicle to minimize boil off of the cryogenic propellants. Now, for the, for the vehicle going to the moon, we uh, have some uh, insulation. Uh, to, to minimize uh, boil off. It would probably be launching every few hours, aspirationally. Okay, wow. Uh, there's a lot to unpack and not quite unpack from that presentation. This has been something that we've been waiting for over two years for. I'm happy that it came, uh, but you know, not a ton of new information in here that we didn't already know. I do want to quickly thank the journalists and the uh, crowd who participated in the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. Uh, the Q&As were by far the most informative part of the entire evening uh, thanks to the questions of those journalists. So thank you for jumping in because we got a lot of really great information. Now, I have to kind of remind myself that this presentation was really for the general public, for general news media, and for politicians really to kind of just get it up to speed on what's going on down in Starbase. For folks who watch my channel and like myself who are following this project like on a weekly or daily basis there was not a ton of new information in here but there was some really important context provided to decisions that SpaceX is making that's going to impact the project in the long term so the main takeaways I walked away from this uh Raptor 2 is in full swing and they're building out about one per day so it should take about five or six weeks to build enough Raptors to have a full stack ship so that's fantastic Boca Chica from SpaceX's standpoint or really Elon's standpoint is being accepted as a R&D location we've been reading the tea leaves for a long time in terms of where SpaceX and Starship are going to have their future uh, Boca Chica has a lot of logistical uh, issues in terms of the launch profiles that are available to the location uh, it's also it's a beach like there's no infrastructure there right now they're building everything from the ground up and ksc has a ton of built-in infrastructure and the launch profiles are everything you can want out of an eastern facing range so it's, it's a much more ideal and much more efficient place to launch from elon was a little picky on refueling and refilling he says that there's more three three and a half times more liquid oxygen being refilled into Starship uh, than liquid methane, which would count as fuel, but you are still adding fuel to the ship. So I don't know, uh, that's a silly semantic, but we'll let them have it. Elon here is also saying that the vehicle and uh, the ground systems are gonna be ready when the FAA, if the FAA uh, approves them to fly uh, Starship orbital flight out of Starbase. I'm not completely convinced. There's a lot of other work and testing that needs to be done. Uh, these vehicles, uh, bo the booster hasn't been static fired. Uh, the tank farm still needs a lot of work. Plus, it's going to take a, probably a few months to fill up all of the propellant tanks at the tank farm uh, in order to fuel a starship and get it ready for launch uh so even if the faa approval did come in early february i wouldn't expect the first orbital attempt to be for a few months after and finally the 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 more fun thing that elon kind of squashed that a lot of people were kind of hoping for was point-to-point -point flights from boca chica to kennedy space center not entirely surprising there's a lot of risk that goes along with doing that flying over populated areas at a relatively low altitude and also the costs of just flying your ship uh, from point a to point b like that which doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're going to have manufacturing and launch facilities at kennedy space center you can just build ships there or kind of a novel idea that spacex has already taken advantage of 
put the ship on a boat and take it to its final destination. Uh, rockets are put on barges and ships all the time for transportation. Starbase is next to the Gulf of Mexico. Kennedy Space Center is next to the Atlantic Ocean. It's very feasible to put a starship on a barge and within a week it'll be at Kennedy Space Center. So point to point from Starbase to Kennedy Space Center, although technically possible, not really a practical use of transporting starships uh, from such a short distance. But point to point is still very much in play for if you want to fly half or three quarters around the planet. That uh, makes a lot more sense from a financial and logistical standpoint. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed the cut down. It was really fun to make. Consider following me on Twitter. I'm at TJ underscore Cooney and subscribing to my channel for more space videos, specifically around human spaceflight. All right, thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.